What do a tire, a cow, and a blimp have in common? I know, it's a strange question. These things might not seem similar, but believe it or not, each of them played a key role in transforming the Salt River Valley, where Phoenix is today, from a mostly empty desert into one of the largest cities in the United States. They also have another thing in common, a man from Boston named Paul Weeks Litchfield. Let's explore the roles that these things and this man played in shaping the state that we know and love today. On July 26th, 1875, Paul Litchfield was born in Boston, Massachusetts. His father was a successful photographer and a figure in the family's community. Young Litchfield's family had a background in building ships so, naturally, he grew up fascinated by great ocean-going machines. He saw the transition from sailing vessels to steam power firsthand during trips to Maine, visiting shipyards owned by his grandfather. He was so entranced by this technology that by age five, he wrote a letter to Santa Claus, asking for his very own steamship. Litchfield grew up listening to tales of great explorers, imagining the adventures that he too might have someday. When he was 17, he left home for college, a whole three miles away at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, one of the most respected schools for engineers in the world. MIT was a very expensive school to attend, so his family had to make sacrifices, but it helped that he could be just a stone's throw away. At MIT, he studied a variety of engineering subjects, eventually deciding to specialize in chemical engineering. In his senior year, he wrote a report on American industries. In doing so, he visited a local rubber plant for research and was wholly disgusted by the sights and smells of the rubber production process. He wanted nothing to do with it. Little did he know that the rubber industry would be the very place that he would earn his fortune. Just a few years later, Litchfield would find himself working for the L.C. Chase Rubber Company after struggling to find a well-paying job anywhere else. At the time Paul Litchfield entered the rubber industry, most of the tires being made were for bicycles and horse-drawn carriages, as cars were not yet widely available. Despite having a college degree from one of the best engineering universities in the world, Litchfield began his career at the very bottom of the L.C. Chase Rubber Company, cleaning raw rubber and preparing it for processing. However, he worked very hard and looked for ways to improve the company's practices, sharing ideas with his superiors along the way. His bosses recognized his talents, and after a few years, he was promoted to the assistant superintendent of a new bicycle tire factory owned by the L.C. Chase Company. Litchfield was very happy with his new job, but he didn't stay long. The rubber industry was about to change very quickly as cars were becoming widely available, and Litchfield knew he needed to be a part of the change. A new organization called Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company was experimenting with making tires for cars in Akron, Ohio. So Litchfield made the difficult decision to leave his family in Boston and move out west. Paul Litchfield really hit his stride in Akron. He worked as an engineer, a factory superintendent, and formed a group of researchers to come up with new ideas and inventions. They created many important inventions. Most importantly, the first air-filled tires for trucks. The group Litchfield founded would go on in later years to invent the first practical tires for airplanes, special conveyor belts for factories, and many other things. Often, the products they designed weren't brand new ideas, but improvements on existing ideas. This process is called research and development where engineers used science to help design new products. At the time, it was more common for companies to simply come up with new and wild ideas without testing them first. So by carefully designing and testing their ideas, Paul Litchfield and his team were on the cutting edge of the industry. Goodyear based many of their new products on designs that Litchfield and his team created. In addition to helping invent things, Litchfield traveled all around the world, setting up Goodyear factories and plantations in the US, Canada, Japan, Southeast Asia, Central and South America, Europe, South Africa, and Australia. He became a very well-traveled man, and he developed the knack for solving problems. In 1916, there was a very big problem that needed solving. A type of cotton called long staple cotton, which was crucial for making the tires Litchfield had designed, was all of a sudden hard to come by. World War I in Europe and Africa meant that the cotton the United States would normally get from Egypt was out of reach. 
and an insect called the boll weevil was destroying the long staple cotton in the American South. There was no other place for America to get the amount of long staple cotton we needed for the war effort and for use at home. Thankfully, Litchfield had read a study that the U.S. Department of Agriculture had conducted where they proved the special cotton could be grown here in Arizona. Litchfield wasted no time traveling to the deserts of the Salt River Valley to see for himself if such a thing could be possible and realized immediately that it could work. He tried asking local farmers if they would consider growing cotton for Goodyear. And when they refused, he asked his superiors at Goodyear Tire and Rubber to consider setting up a cotton growing operation here in Arizona. Litchfield explained that Goodyear could help America with the war effort and make a nice profit. They were easily convinced and offered up the money to buy the land. Suddenly, Litchfield found himself overseeing a 2,000 man operation known as the Southwest Cotton Company. For the supervising workers, Litchfield Park, then known as Litchfield Branch, was built. This company town had a general store, school, cafe, barbershop, drugstore, pool hall, sources for water and electricity, and other things that made living in the desert possible. The massive operation built by the Southwest Cotton Company helped spark a boom which is when a good or service is suddenly in high demand. The problem with booms is they don't often last forever, often ending in a crash, when the demand for the good or service decreases. When the war ended in 1919, a crash ended the demand for cotton, and the massive operation Litchfield had created found itself in trouble. The company decided to use what it had learned in turning the desert floor into a fertile place to grow cotton, and began researching new ideas for farming. Seeing a way to tie into Arizona's cattle industry, the company developed the practice of green feeding, or feeding cows with crops like alfalfa. They experimented with conserving water, growing different crops in each season, and other ideas. Years later, in 1943, farmers would begin to come from all around the world to learn these new ideas. The harsh desert became a testing ground for these practices. If they could work here, they could work anywhere. At the same time, Paul Litchfield encouraged the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company to use the harsh terrain of the Southwest Valley to test new tires in conditions far more challenging than normal. His contributions eventually earned him the title of President and CEO of the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company in 1926. Paul Litchfield's fascination with ships stayed with him throughout his life, and in the 1920s, he finally got to work around them. These ships, however, weren't like normal ships. Combining his lifelong fascination and Goodyear's experience with inflatable technology, Litchfield formed an alliance between the Lufschenbau Zeppelin Company and Goodyear in 1924, creating the Goodyear Zeppelin Corporation. Together, they made airships lighter-than-air vehicles filled with helium gas designed to transport people across the skies and over oceans. Litchfield was certain that this technology was the way of the future. While the technology didn't take off in the way that Litchfield had hoped, it did spark another enduring legacy that we can all still see today, the Goodyear blimp. The relationship between Goodyear and Zeppelin was always a little bit tricky. Since Zeppelin was a German company, and tensions following World War I were high. As World War II grew closer, the companies parted ways. However, under Litchfield's leadership, Goodyear was left with a vast amount of aircraft building experience. And by the 1940s, Goodyear was once again ready to help America win a war. Since Goodyear Tire and Rubber already owned land in the Southwest Valley of Phoenix, Goodyear Zeppelin, now called the Goodyear Aircraft Company, broke ground in the summer of 1941 on an aircraft manufacturing facility at what is today the Goodyear Airport. There, they made parts for planes including the F-2G Corsair Fighter, the B-26 Marauder Bomber, and a unique seaplane called the Goodyear Duck. Over three million pounds of metal were turned into airplane parts at the Arizona plant alone. After making such a big contribution in World War II, the company, now called Goodyear Aerospace, spent the 1960s developing cutting-edge equipment for the military. They would go on to invent, test, and produce parts for a brand new type of radar, the SAR, 
which would be crucial to the development of the SR-71 Blackbird, the fastest manned jet to ever fly. The foundation laid by Litchfield and Goodyear Aerospace made Arizona an ideal place for aerospace companies to design and test cutting-edge ideas. Today, companies like Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, Honeywell, General Dynamics, Boeing, and Northrop Grumman operate facilities in Arizona. When Paul W. Litchfield first came to the Salt River Valley in 1916, only about 11,000 people called this area home. Today, over 5 million people live in the greater Phoenix area, making it the fifth largest city in the United States. Litchfield's cotton fields helped grow cities all over the Southwest Valley and directly led to places like Litchfield Park and Goodyear. Arizona remains today a prime location for automotive testing and cutting edge agriculture. Thanks, of course, to contributions from the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company and the Southwest Cotton Company. Litchfield himself can be credited, in part, for popularizing industrial research and development, in addition to his numerous patents and inventions. His later days were often spent here, at Rancho La Loma, just northwest of Litchfield Park. He and his wife Florence would often sit at this very spot, watching the sunset over the White Tank Mountains, admiring the beauty of the desert. Paul Litchfield passed away on March 18, 1959. He was 83 years old. While Litchfield is no longer around today, it's clear that the legacy of his inventions, as well as his numerous contributions to the state of Arizona, are here to stay.